you so much for having me here. This is a, a, an ideal um, kind of perfect storm of generational, cross-generational energy and commitment here, and I'm really thrilled to be a part of it. Now, as you know, I have a very limited amount of time, and unlike most academic settings, I have a clock, which is great. And this means I can stay on time, so I'm going to jump right in with why I'm here, why it matters to me to be here, and how we can work together. But first of all, are you ready to deal with it? Yeah. Are you feeling good? Yeah. All right. The real question I want us to focus on from the very beginning is how hard it is to confront human suffering. Is it hard? Yes. It's very, very hard. It's one thing to talk about change, which is perfect, but to get to change, you've got to confront reality, right? You can call them response to me the whole time through, really, it's okay. It's like, so when I say right, you say? Right. Or you could say? Right. Yes, you see, there you go. <laughs> okay, so why it's important to start with the question of where we are now is because of how we think about the moment we're in and who we are and how we relate to one another, the better we get to a meaningful, sustainable change. Because, you know, I know many of you are young here. Some of you look like you're more closer to my age, but we won't address you for a minute. Hang on. We're going to talk to the young people and say that, you know, you're not the first group of young people to have this level of energy and spirit, right? There have been people before us who've said, hey, we want to make things change, and things have changed dramatically. But a lot continues to confront us. A lot continues to stay the same. And I want to talk about how we talk about change not just the change we want to see, but how the way we talk about change matters so much. So I want to begin with my own experiences as a college professor and a speaker for the last 20 years. Um, and, and what I learned most importantly over the last five or 10 in this journey. And that has to do with the difference between learning about human suffering, inequality, injustice, and how to absorb the learning about human rights, inequality, and injustice. Now, I focus on race in America. I'm, I work on African American culture and history very significantly. And I, will, and I teach at Brown, and I've taught at many other universities across the years. And I find that it's a great struggle to get people to deal with the emotional toe of the material. When I was much younger and I started teaching, I thought it would be just the facts. I'll give out all the facts and social change will happen. How could people look at these facts? How could they look at this information and not leap up off their sofas and just get going? Right? I thought facts would answer it. And I discovered that facts really don't do it all. That we know a lot and we've known a lot and we keep re-knowing a lot. And then sometimes we have to be reminded a lot because we don't want to hear it. Um, and that facts alone don't take care of it. And then I started teaching um, a big, big lecture class um, in California and had a, one of these experiences that was completely dumbfounding, uh, where we'd spent all this time dealing with African American history and culture, and someone said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't come from a slave state, I'm not responsible for this, my family wasn't even here, why are you telling me this? <laughs> that was one of those moments where even though you're indoors, your hair blows back, you know, you're like, Am I going to make it? Um, and I thought, wow, she feels really bad. This material has made her feel really, really bad. Even though I don't intend that, and even though my goal is to bring everybody together to work to make change, some things we got to look at. Remember I said what's around us is uncomfortable. And I realized that I needed to think about how we work together. So if there's one thing I want you to do while you're here throughout this amazing event, is realize that one category or another, you're going to find, whether it's race, whether it's gender, whether it's sexuality, whether it's questions of the environment, you may find yourself in uncomfortable positions in relationship to the fact of the matter, in relationship to the truth. This is very true about race in America today, because we don't we're, we, we've been led to believe that if we ignore it, it'll go away. That race is the problem as opposed to racism. That if we pretend we're, ever, we're, we're all the same and we're, being colorblind is the solution, that somehow white power, white supremacy, white whatever we want to call it, white privilege will somehow disappear from the face of the earth if we stop seeing color. This is absurd, right? I mean, it seems to me absurd.
what we have to do is transform the meaning of our various identities, right? So we have to see who we are, see who we're connected to, but acknowledge how we are positioned in society. It wouldn't make any sense for people to say, oh, well, you know, I'm heterosexual, and that has nothing to do with uh, anti-gay activism. It's just not connected. My privilege is not connected to your suffering. Absurd. But that's what we say when we say colorblindness. We say, I don't see you in all your complexity, which includes your race, because to do that means to acknowledge my privilege. And this is a great crime. This is a great crime. So I have three strategies for staying out of this box, because I think that you know it's easy for me to talk to you right now, but you'll find that as you get deeper into certain moments, this is especially true for the high school students who are here, when you start confronting it, the emotional intensity can be overwhelming. And one of the things we retreat to is our individuality, right? We retreat to our individual. I love all people. <laughs> You've heard this before, right? <laughs> I love all people. I, don't, I know it's terrible. This is bad. I'm not responsible for this because what, you know, what could I do, right? Now, we don't have to be the cause to be implicated in the situation. We don't have to be the cause to be implicated in the situation. So the first thing I want you to keep in mind when you get in this moment is that you are, and we all are, myself included, we're individuals and we're members of groups. Okay, repeat after me. We're individuals, individuals. and we're members of groups. And groups is plural because we're all members of many different groups, right? We're not one group of people. We're gendered, we're raced or multi-raced, we have religious groups, we have sexual orientation groups, we have class groups, we have national groups, we have ethnic identity groups, etc. If we're looking at power, we have to remember that when we're in an individual state, we're completely creative and individual. I, I broke the mold, right? There's no other Trisha Rose. I mean, could there possibly be? See, exactly, thank you. Let's do that one more time. I'm Trisha Rose, I broke the mold. There couldn't be another one, right? Okay, much better, much better, yeah. You too, you broke the mold. You're a completely autonomous individual with all your quirks and, and, and tweaks and different ways of being, but you're also members of groups. And what that means is that in my case, there are experiences I've had because I'm female, because I'm from Harlem and from a working class background, because I'm black, that means that I have to grapple with situations that some other people really don't know anything about. Right. Unless they work hard to figure it out. How are they gonna figure it out if they don't know I'm a member of a group? They're not gonna be able to see it. They're gonna basically say, well, you're an individual and we just love you exactly as you are, Trisha Rose, the individual who broke the mold. And I say, yeah, I broke that mold, but I'm part of a much bigger mold that's clearly unbroken. And that mold has to do with the way race and class come together. Why, when I was 16 years old and went to a very, very wealthy friend's house, they asked me to use the back entrance. I'm not that old, so it wasn't as long ago as you'd like to say. <laughs> I'm old, but I'm not that old. So the first thing is to really remember that we're individuals and members of groups because otherwise that kind of experience gets minimized. And that leads me to my second point, where we end up saying, hey, you know, that's terrible, Trisha, which many people said to me then. You know, you got asked, that was just one bad doorman, as if he was to blame for the logic that I should have been a maid or a servant just by definition. That's sort of him, but it's not him. It's a structural logic, right? That's the part of, of recognizing we're members of groups. But the second most important thing is that when I shared that story, some people would say to me, you know, oh, he's just a bad example. Most of us are past that. And that means that second one is this moment where we try to minimize painful elements of people suffering. Oh, so-and-so was really sexist, but you know there's a lot of great people out here who aren't or whatever, right? That may be true, but that denies the reality. We have to be honest about the pain and suffering that serious structural inequality and oppression causes people all the time. We have to be serious. Because that pain sometimes makes us feel bad and sometimes guilty, depending on the situation, we like to minimize as a way to cover over, not because we're being hostile, but because we're uncomfortable. 
If we want particularly cross-racial understanding, we have to get outside of our box and pay really close attention to the emotional impact of what suffering is for those who are in poor and minority communities who face ongoing discrimination. It's not an occasional thing. Stop and frisk in New York is a policy phrase for a practice that's been going on for 350 years. Now, you may not remember, but it was only, say, five to six, maybe seven years ago when people were very comfortable saying, I don't think the police particularly target black and brown people in poor communities. I don't, I've never heard of that. I've never seen that. Well, it's because you don't live in predominantly poor black and brown communities and watch. If you did, you'd see it all day, every day. Right? So you have to listen with the assumption that you're an individual, but you're a member of a group. And as a member of a group, you might have privileges that would render you unable to see the experiences that this other group might be having. Then you have to be willing to deal with the pain that that reality causes. That's very difficult, but it's crucial to group change. It's crucial to the connecting for change this kind of event is really about, because you have to connect. That means you have to empathetically attach to other people's suffering. Okay, the third thing that's absolutely crucial, it seems to me, is that we have to anticipate the um, emotional suffering I've talked about and figure out how we're going to handle it and not deny it. That means we have to build in that part. It can't be we work with facts or we work with the imaginary future we're going to create and we don't attend to it. So we have to make space for this, right? Now we can't be indulgent, but we have to make space for it and we have to be responsible with it. That means we have to sort of see ourselves as agents of our own change, even as we're agents of collective change.